Uh, join me to welcome uh, Mommy Pastor Mrs. Susan Oluwotini. God bless you. I think we can be better. Can we stop on our feet and give God a clap of friend? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You may be seated in His awesome presence. Thank you so much for having us. I said that earlier on, and I didn't just say that for the sake of saying, because if, uh, if you decide that you don't want us, there's no way we can come. Hallelujah. Amen. If somebody comes to your house and you don't want them in your house, uh, they can't force themselves in, isn't it? So thank you so much. We're not taking it for granted that <clears throat> we're here. It is an opportunity, and we really appreciate you, and we pray that the Lord will continue to build our relationship because we've now known one another, uh, not very well yet, but I guess before the end of the day, we know ourselves better. Uh, I pray the Lord God Almighty will count us all worthy, even to be partaker of heavenly relationship with Him in Jesus' name. The first topic that we're going to look at is, uh, we're going to look at a conflict. Conflict in relationship. And... Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is a word that when we mention, the first thing that comes to mind is usually negative. But it is not all that negative, depending on how we perceive things. Hallelujah. Um, we thank God because we are both physical and spiritual being. Um, we've done the spiritual part we prayed earlier on, uh, because it is body, soul, and spirit, or spirit, soul, and body. Uh, we fed the body as well. And we're going to go into some other uh, spiritual aspect later. But I'm just going to try as much as possible to do a bit of the physical, the things that we're about to with, the reality of life. So, and conflict is the reality of life. We live in a world that is full of conflict, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we have to deal and navigate our ways through all these situations. And you will see that even in relationship, in married relationship, we cannot but to talk of conflict because we do have conflict. And one of the reasons we have conflict is because we're adults, you know, we have our own views and ideas. We're not babies. We're not, you know, toddlers. <laughs> we're mature people. You have your view, I have my view. And therefore, that is likely to bring conflict. Can you imagine if all of us are thinking the same way? Everybody is just having the same thing on their mind. You know, if, if pastor says, you know, yeah, are we doing this? We just say, yes, sir. Are we not doing this? Yes, sir. In fact, pastor will be worried. He will start praying. He will start conducting deliverance. You know, so you, you see that because we have different views, sometimes these views come to play um, in conflict. So conflict is inevitable. But conflict is not all that bad. Conflict could be good. And conflict could be a bad one. It depends on our perception and how we see it. Hallelujah. So I'm just going to go through one or two points um, because I'm mindful of our time. Now when we talk of a bad conflict, we're looking at a conflict where it is purposefully about our self-interest. You're married, but you're selfish. You want your own way all the time. It's got to be about you. It's I, me, and myself. You know, self-ego. You know, it's me. Why should he say that to me? Who is he to say that or do that to me? Why am I, you know, why is it You know, sometimes as Christians, we also say, why is this happening to me? But the question you should ask yourself, who exactly do you want it to happen to? If you don't want it to happen to you, as a child of God, do you wish on anyone else? Hallelujah. So when it is about, why me? Why can't I do this? Why can't I have this? Why is he doing this to me? Why is she doing that to me? Why? Why, why is all about me? When I perceive a wrongdoing, everything that my, maybe my spouse is doing to me is wrong. He's always wrong. He's always doing something wrong. I don't do anything wrong. That's selfish. And that will bring about conflict. <clears throat> When we have dispute that is unresolved, and we do have dispute, we have dispute because we don't, you know, think the same way. We see things differently. In fact, man and woman will never see things the same way because God did not wire us up the same way. 
And those are one of the things that we really need to think about when we're having conflict. When we feel cheated, sometimes you feel like, oh no, I can't take that. You know, they're taking me for granted. Why is she taking me for granted? Why is he taking me for granted? Is it because I'm a nice person? You know, I'm always nice. I don't always see myself as not being nice. Um, I wonder if anybody ever come up uh, uh, you know, around and say, I'm not a nice person. No, we don't do that. We're always nice. And so it's the other person that is not nice. Those are bad conflict. When you have things like that, you're likely to have a terrible conflict. And those conflict is likely to be unresolved. But, you know, if you are able to work together, we call it collaboration. If you are able to kind of look at the conflict you're having in a godly way. Okay, this thing is happening. As Christians, what do I need to do? How should I handle it? That would be a good conflict. If you're able to have a discussion with the person you're having a conflict with, that would be a good conflict because it will bring about uh, a solution. If you're sincere and you're ready to accept your own part, responsibility in this conflict, because when we, say, when we talk about conflict, I can't have conflict with myself, can I? I must have conflict with someone else. I don't usually have conflict with myself. So if I'm having conflict with someone else, I need to look at myself and say, what role am I playing in this conflict? It's not going to be someone else that is always causing this conflict. I must play some part in it. Whether my part is good or bad is relevant. I play a part in it. It could be positive. It could be negative. So conflict has to do with when we have sometimes a common interest. For example, Mommy Pastor is my friend, very good friend of mine, even though I think we're meeting for the first time. I, I was looking at your picture in the office and thinking, I've never met this lady before, but we're meeting for the first time, but we're friends. Because as long as we're you know, Christian, we're brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. So now we're good friends. <clears throat> now we're both competing for a job. What do you think is going to happen? Even though we're very close friends, and we both want the same job. We're going for the same interview. What do you think, even though we're good friends, what do you think will happen? What do we normally do? I want this to be interactive. That's why I said it's going to be, you know, like a practical part of it, and then pastor will bring the spiritual. What do you think we're going to do as friends? We're very good friends, and we're both going for a job. We need to prepare for interview. What is going to happen? Because it happens all the time. What, we do, what do we do with ourselves? We're going, to have, we're going to compete. Please speak up. We're going to compete. And when you start complete, competing, what happens? You're going to just go to, I'm going to go to and say, you know what? This is what I think. You know, they're going to ask us so that you can prepare very well. Do we do that? But, but there's nothing wrong in us doing that. If we perceive that this thing we're thinking of as conflict is not a conflict. If you and I think about it and we say, you know what? She is not going to be the person to interview me, and I'm not going to interview her. We're going be before a panel. They will have to make a decision. So we both need to prepare ourselves and make the best person win. If we have that perception, are we going to have any conflict? Please, let's talk. We're not going to have a conflict. So most of the time, conflict comes because of the way we perceive it. So the first thing that we need to bear in mind is that conflict is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, in a relationship, in a good relationship, it will be a very good thing. In fact, if you don't have a conflict, you might be so complacent in your relationship because you think everything is on Kidari. And it might not be. Hallelujah. So conflict comes because we, we have a conflict of interest where we perceive that, you know, this thing, you know, that we're both going for is not going to be of benefit to me. It's not, hallelujah, it's not going to be, a, I'm not going to be able to benefit from it or because, you know, there's a competition. And that happens in a marriage relationship as well. And I will give us some examples. <clears throat> so conflict is the way we understand something or we interpret or regard a situation. Or what we think we're seeing. Sometimes we think we're seeing things. We think we're hearing things. And that is why when a couple is in conflict and they're talking, one will say, you said this. The other will say, I didn't say that. 
Because what you said, the way the other person perceived it and heard it, is not what you meant. Hallelujah. So you're saying one thing, but because of the other person's, your spouse's, you know, um, perception of what you're saying, they are hearing something different. And that is why it is very important that when we have conflict, we need to find a way to resolve it. And one of the means of resolving it is, you know, we both calm down and we sit and we collaborate. God will help us to be able to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. So someone's conflict is someone's ability to notice and understand things that are not so obvious. Ability to notice and to understand things that are not obvious. So if, for example, your spouse is saying, you don't love me, and you as a guy, you're doing everything possible, and you, you know, you're doing everything that you know to do, to give love, and your wife is saying, for example, you don't love me, and you're like, what is wrong with you? Do you want me to give you my head? No, you need to understand there's something that she is lacking, she wants from you, that you're not giving. And that is giving that conflict. Don't just assume that I'm doing everything. I'm working my brain out. I'm, you know, around you. I'm doing everything you ask me to do. You're still saying I don't love me. Try and find out what do you mean by I don't love you. What is she talking about when she says I don't love her? Because there are messages, subliminal messages that is passed across. So conflict is the ability to notice things that are not so obvious. So the way we perceive things, the way we react to things, we either help our marriages or it will mar our marriages. Conflict is an agent of change and it helps us to deal with our complacency. You know, before marriage, you know what we used to do when we were courting or dating and, you know, you can't sleep if you don't see one another. You know, you call on phones, you send romantic messages, which, you know, some of us find difficult to send these days and to say these days. You know, I love you 20 times in one hour, you know, and uh, you are the, I don't know, sugar in my tea or whatever. All those sweet things that we used to say. And then we got married. What happened? We settled down to normal lifestyle of complacency. We don't say that anymore. And before you know it, the marriage becomes stale because there's no, there, are, there, there is nothing to excite your spouse. There is nothing romantic coming. And most of us need to go back to the book of uh, Solomon to go and read some of the things that he says, you know. So we stop and we become complacent. I know you, you know me. You know, so what's the big deal? I've seen everything about you. So why do I need to tell you I love you or, you know, be romantic to you, you know? Some of us don't even remember birthday. Uh, person talking. We don't remember birthdays. We don't remember any special days. You know, we don't do anything, you know, because we're so used to one another. And what we don't understand is that these things can cause conflict. Sometimes we think that the things that cause big conflict is all those big issues. But there are underlying, you know, little, little things that causes conflict. Today, you know, he overlooks that, you know, conflict. Tomorrow he overlooks. The whole thing is building up. And one day, that spouse is going to just blow up because there have been issues, minor, minor issues, that have been swept on the carpet, not dealt with. So, for instance, I'll give an example. You like, as a man, you like to have a pandanyam every evening. Every evening, your wife must make you pandanyam. And she's been doing that quite a right. So the, the marriage seems okay. Everybody's happy as long as you have, you have your pandan yam, which she makes every, and it has to be freshly made every day. So it's nice. And then on this particular day, she, you know, she decides she wants to go out with her friends. And she'll be going out at 3 p.m. And at 3 p.m., she'll be coming back late. So the husband says, no, you can't go out. So the wife says, why can't I go out? I don't go out all the time. The husband says, but, you know, I don't see why you should go out and come back late. In the husband's brain, is thinking, my pounded yam will not be ready because she's not going to be at home. And I must have my pounded yam. In the wife's mind, she's like, I don't always ask this guy that I want to go out. Why is he saying I shouldn't go out? 
In the husband's mind, it's, it's like, I'm even asking her not to go out. She's not even respecting my authority. She doesn't have respect for me. In the wife's mind, she's like, what is wrong with this man? For once I want to go out, she's not allowed. I mean, it's not allowed. I'm not a baby. So in their brain, conflict is already building up. I want to go out. I'm not a baby. So who are you to say I can't go out? You want to go out. I'm your husband. I'm the head of the home. I'm even saying to you for once you can't go out. You're not respect. So there are so many things that could cause conflict. So we need to be very, very aware of these little, little foxes that eat the vine. So that one would be a bigger issue if it's not dealt with. But I think, oh, it's not a big deal. We can deal with that. I forgot about that. I don't even think about that. But when that happens again, it will remind you of what has happened before and it can bring a big conflict. So conflict is not really a bad thing. Conflict is neutral. It is how you perceive and how you handle the conflict that makes a lot of difference. Okay, when a man or a woman, a spouse, let me just say a spouse, decides you spend all his or her money without contributing to the family purse. When one spouse in the house decides, no, I'm not going to contribute anything. I'm just going to spend my money as I like. And it's one spouse, one party that is, you know, taking care of the home, taking care of the kids. What goes on in the mind of the other, you know, of the other spouse? You're taking me for granted. I can't spend my own money. You're spending your own money. You come in to enjoy the benefits of this house. You're taking me for a ride. And that will cause a big conflict. When a spouse decides, I'm going to be spending money to my family. Like I said, I want to be very practical. I'm going to be sending money to my family because I'm working. And somebody in that home is not able to send money to his or her family, even though that person too is working, because that person has to keep the home. What do you think will happen? There will be conflict. And if that conflict is not dealt with, it will go further. And that is why we have some spouses that will be building properties in Ghana, Nigeria, whatever, without their spouse's knowledge or name on it. Because they're thinking, really? This person is taking me for granted. This person thinks I'm an idiot. Ah. You're sending your own money to your family. And I am spending my money to look after us. You know what? I'm going to build a house. You're not going to be part of that house. So conflict, you might think, is a minor thing. If you don't deal with it, the, and you perceive it as a bad thing, and you don't handle it, it becomes a big issue. Now, I spoke about, you know, collaboration. What is collaboration? Collaboration is the ability to work together. We work with other people in organizations. We all go to work. You have a teamwork. There must be a teamwork in marriage for us to be able to deal with conflict because conflict will come. Conf There's no way we will not have conflict. Even God, who created Adam and Eve, do they not have conflict with him? He told Adam, tell your wife, make sure you don't eat this fruit that is in the midst of the garden. Did they not? They ate it. And there was a conflict. And we know the result of this date. Even Abraham and Sarah, did they not have a conflict? They had conflict. Then God said to him, I'm going to give you a child. And that child is going to be a child of promise. But I bet the wife says, you know what? It is our culture anyway. If you sleep with your maid, it's still your child as well. You know, that's the way it is. So you can have a child with a guy. That was a conflict between the two of them. So there's no way you and I will not have conflict. Then Jesus had conflict with his disciples. Jesus, our Lord and Master, as godly as he was, and still is, as very humble as he was, and still is, as very accommodating as he was, because those 12 people, they tried him. I mean, they tried him. He still had conflict with them. They still won't do what he has them to do. So what makes you think you and I will not have conflict? What makes you think you and your husband will not have conflict? Well, you didn't marry an idiot. You didn't marry an imbecile. You married an intelligent human being. There will be conflict. But what do you do when you have conflict? Because there's no way we can live our Christian life, live our marital life without having conflict. But we must learn 
to deal with this conflict. So there comes collaboration, and that is in a home where you work together. Not a home where, when I say, you just obey. What I say goes. When I say, you just say yes. Even if you're going to die, I don't care. I say, you do. Before I call, you start jumping. If that is the type of you know, relationship you're having, it's not a godly relationship. It's not a Christian you know, relationship. It's not a biblical relationship. It could be a cultural relationship. But you know what? As born again Christians, as children of God, we need to build a godly relationship biblical relationship if you're a man you need to ask yourself if jesus is the husband of my wife will he do this to my wife if you're a woman you need to ask if jesus is the one that i'm married to would he accept this kind of behavior because whatever you do to your spouse you're doing it unto god and you know what our marriage is a ministry that we're going to give account of. We, we look at ministry as what we do in the church. The charity that we do outside. But you don't know that your marriage is a ministry. Because God specifically gave the lady you are married to, to you as a, as a gift. The, the Bible tells us that God made Adam to sleep. And then he created out of his rib. He took that rib away. And went away to create, I wonder why he had to go away. I, I guess because he didn't want any interruption. Because I guess Adam would have been saying to him, I don't want that bit. I want that bit. Can you put that bit? So he went away to create the woman. And then the Bible says he brought the woman to the man. So he brought that woman as a gift to you. So whatever you do to your wife, you're doing it unto the Lord. Because you can't see God. And whatever you do to your husband... You are doing it unto God because you can't see God physically. So marriage is a ministry. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, the Bible says, It is no good for the man to be alone. I'm going to create a woman to help him. It says, I will create a help that will be comparable to him. Not that the man didn't have any help. The chimpanzees are, were there. The gorillas were there. My sister, you're laughing. But then the Bible says that, you know, Adam will fellowship in the garden. Who was he fellowshipping with apart from when God comes in the evening? He was fellowshipping with the goats and the animals and all. He was playing with them, you know. But they were not comparable to him. They could not give the specific help that is needed. Even God could not give some of the specific help that is needed. So women were created to help our men. So if I'm going to help my man, I can't be giving him conflict. Hallelujah. Amen. And vice versa as well, the Bible says, I know when we talk of help mate, you know, sometimes we think, yeah, that's good. But men, you have a greater assignment. You're supposed to love your wife like Jesus loved the church. How did he love the church? He gave himself. So if somebody walks in and says, out of the two of you, I, know, I want to kill somebody. You're supposed to say, I am the man, kill me. And, and spare my, life, my wife's life. Huh? Look after my children. <laughs> Make sure they're well looked after. Are you more serious though? When the, so when, when, when the women, when the women are saying, ah, submit, submit. And submission is causing a lot of conflict at home. Ah, can't submit. We are, what am I going to submit to with this one? Ah, I'm many more than him. Eh? Um, you know, the one running around looking after the children is really not doing much. It could be vice versa. So why am I submitting? What is it submit? I mean, look at him from head to toe. There's nothing to submit. God did not say submit to him because he had money or because he can speak well or because he had good status or, you know, he says submit. But he says, love your wife. It is, because it is, but you have to submit as well. It doesn't matter. So people will say, ah, how can I submit? So this thing should not be causing conflict in the home. That's what I'm trying to say. Love your wife like Jesus loved the church. And Jesus is going to ask you. I pray we all make it Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. That our Christianity will not end on this planet. Because that would be fatality. It would be fatal. If all we are doing as Christians would just end on earth. 
Because we need to meet him. We need to be with him. We need to rule and reign with him. And that is why we need to be careful as Christians. What we do, we must be very, very careful. Because our life will not end on this planet. So when God sees you and says, the woman I gave you, what did you do with her? What is, I know. I, I understand. I got the gist. I got the gist. <laughs> uh, what are you going to say you, you, you did with her? So we need to be very careful when we have conflict. Ladies, when we have conflicts, we need to be able to learn to resolve the conflict. We need to try as much as possible to help, to be a helpmate to resolve the conflict. Men, the Bible says in 1 Peter, I would like to think chapter 3, it says you need to deal with your, with your wife according to knowledge. Knowledge of what? It didn't say deal with all the women in the church according to knowledge. It implies that you need to get a PhD on your wife. If your wife is always causing conflict at home, go and learn, study her. Brother, study your wife. Why is this woman giving me aggravation? What's the problem exactly? You need to do that because God says, study, no, deal with your wife according to knowledge. So that you know your own wife, know all the other women. It didn't say know your sister. It didn't say know your mother. It didn't say know your siblings. It says deal with your wife according to knowledge. That means you need to be able to sit down and have a conversation. In the homes where you don't converse, you don't discuss anything, you are not doing the will of God in your home. You need to be able to sit and discuss. Your spouse is not an idiot. She, he or she may not have much knowledge, but there's something in that spouse. There's nobody who is empty barrel. God did not create any empty barrel. And the Bible says that two are better than one in Ecclesiastes. She may not be able to contribute much. He may not be able to say much, but there's something in him or her that God had deposited in there to be of use in your marriage relationship, no matter how small it is. Don't underestimate your spouse. Don't marginalize your spouse because it will cause a lot of conflict. Okay? Understand and know your wife according to knowledge. And wife, what do the scripture says in Ephesians? It says, and you must respect and honor your own husband. Not every other man. You know, ladies, God will help us. If these are all men, and I walk in into this gathering, I will greet everybody. Good afternoon, sir. Good morning, sir. Good evening, sir. What happened when I get to my husband? I passed. Just sit down. Hello. <laughs> you know, the Bible says you should honor and respect your own husband. We're not saying you should disrespect all other men, but you must honor and respect your own husband because you will give account of what you do to God at the end of it. So, collaboration is very important. Work together. If there is any conflict in a home, maybe the, the, I don't want to keep saying, I'll just use the word spouse because it could happen with male and female. Maybe the, the spouse is very uncaring. Maybe your spouse is very selfish. Maybe your spouse has got some funny mentality of what marriage should be all about. But you need to sit together to look at what is causing the conflict and to be able to work together. Maybe your spouse as a male is the type that believes that men don't cook, which I find quite strange because most of our best chef in this land happens to be male. If you don't cook, how come some males are the best chef in our land? And they earn fantastic money. It means that you can cook. You just don't want to cook. And the Bible tells us, hallelujah, in Genesis, if you remember the story, I'm not going into it because I'm conscious of time. Please, when I have about 10 minutes, let, let me know. You know, the Bible tells us that three, three guests came in. They were passing, actually passing by. And Abraham saw them and ran after them and implored them to stay the night with him. And what did he do? He ran after them. He, you know, persuaded them to stay. And then he ran to his wife. And he asked his wife to bake a cake. At least to prepare something for them to eat. Then he ran to his servant. And he asked the servant to prepare the meat. 
and then he took the food and presented it to the guests and he waited on them. He was a waiter. That was a patriarchal society. In that type of society, women were non-entity. Women were not recognized. And yet, at that particular time, as far back as then, Adam and, I mean, Abraham and Sarah were able to work together. Collaboration. As you work together in your offices, in your place of work as a team, you also need to learn to work together with your spouse. How you want your home to be is dependent on you, not on anybody else. It's not dependent on your parents. It's not dependent on marriages that you've seen outside. It's not dependent on anybody coming to speak to you. It is how you lay your bed. You will lie on it. Do you have a goal in your, in your home? Do you have a goal in your marriage? What is your goal? Do you, don't we all have goals? At the beginning of this year, did you not sit down to say, you know what, this is what I intend to achieve. What do you intend to achieve in your marriage? Why did you get married? What's your purpose of marriage? Is it because you were of age and you thought, you know what, I'm old enough, let me be married, have children, and that's it. If that is why you got married, then you've missed it. Because marriage is for a lot of things. Marriage is to show forth the glory of the Lord and the relationship, hallelujah, between God and the church. Marriage is to tell the people of the world who are cohabiting that, you know, as sons and daughters of God, this is what marriage is like. Marriage is to, re to mirror the life of Christ, to mirror our Christianity. You know, everything we do is spiritual. Your marriage is spiritual. People are watching you. When we came in today, didn't we pray first before we start the program? Me, we prayed because we're spiritual people. So your marriage must mirror to the world and to the next generation coming what kind of, you know, uh, relationship we have with Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. So communication gap must be dealt with. I'm rushing now because of time. You must have a good communication skill. Communication is not about talking. Because when you're talking, I'm hearing something different. Communication is the ability to pass information across in such a way that we both understand what we're doing. I understand what you're doing. You understand what I'm doing. So we can work on it together. We can say this is the vision. And for me to be able to run with a vision in my home, I need to know what the vision is for my husband. What is the vision? If I don't know the vision, I can't run with you. And that will cause conflict. So let us know in your home, what is your vision? What is the vision for your marriage? What is the vision for your relationship? What do you have planned in the next five years? Where do you see your relationship? Where do you see your marriage? Where do you see yourself? Or your marriage is a, a library book for every other people to read. Your marriage should be for yourself and to mirror Christ. Hallelujah. You should enjoy your marriage. And the way to enjoy it is to make sure that you have skills to deal with conflict. And one of the skills I've mentioned is collaboration. Work together. It doesn't matter what you think your spouse is. Please give them the opportunity. They have input in that marriage. Make sure you have good communication. Speak out your mind in a very good you know, way. And the Bible says that two cannot work together except they agree. And two cannot agree if they're not communicating. For those of us, if you're here and you're not communicating, I pray the Lord God Almighty will touch your hearts. The Almighty God will make a way for you. The Almighty God will bridge that gap that has been created in the mighty name of Jesus. So we need to examine whatever conflict we have. And we need to ask ourselves, why are we having this conflict? Why am I so angry with my husband? Sometimes the conflict is coming not because of your spouse, not because of what your spouse is doing presently. It's remind, whatever is happening to you is reminding you of the past hurts, past pain, and past experiences that you've gone through that you have not disclosed or you know, explained to your spouse. So your husband is reminding you or your wife is reminding you of something that when you remember is bringing pain. You are reacting, but your reaction is not necessarily because of what is happening now. It's the fact that you are reminding me this thing I don't want to remember. But when you do this thing, it reminds me of the pain that I have gone through in the past. It reminds me of the hurts that somebody has put me through in the past. So what do you do when you have conflict? Find a time to talk. 
no matter how difficult you think it is, find a time to talk. Ask why there's conflict. Be vulnerable. Please, let's learn to be vulnerable with one another. If I can't be vulnerable with my husband, who am I going to be vulnerable with? Somebody outside. No way. So the fact that you know my weaknesses doesn't make me a weakling. You know, you know my weaknesses so that you can strengthen me. You also have your weaknesses. Don't let us use our weaknesses, um, you know, as a weapon to damage one another. I can't really go through all this. Hallelujah. I'm going to wrap up in uh, two minutes. We need to have adequate information. We need to change our mentality. Oh, yo, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You know, I don't want my wife to know. I don't want my husband to know. They don't want them to know. Let me give you a real life story. We were having a conference like this or seminar like this. I can't remember where it was. And this man got up and told us a real life story of his brother. His brother lived in the U.S. Well to do, well to do, my heart. So, I mean, he was wealthy. And the brother who lived in the U.K. did not realize that everything that the brother, the senior brother had, older brother had, that his wife was not even aware of it. Everything he was doing in Nigeria, to be specific, he was building houses, he had companies, he had different organizations, he had money, he had things. Even in the U.S., he had a lot. They were all, you know, given to friends to handle. And then he suddenly passed away. And when he passed, he died. So the younger brother from U.K. went, you know, to U.S., to go and help to sort out things. And it was then that the man, the wife, the man's wife found out that ah, my husband had all this, had all this. Where are the documents? She doesn't have it. Brother didn't have documents. Wife did not have documents. The documents were with his friends. You work it out. You think they're going to release all the documents? They're not stupid. So all the work that this guy has done, no matter how terrible, he thought his wife was. He did not disclose it. So all those work now will go to friends, their families, and their children. While his wife and his children will suffer in the U.S. May that not be our portion. Amen. If there's any conflict, how long are we going to live on this planet? That you will not enjoy your marriage. There will be conflict. Let's learn to resolve the conflict. Think about it. Is, this, is it worth this hassle? Is it worth what I'm doing? You know, if you're doing something secretly, your spouse doesn't know because you think he's the most miserable, most nasty human being on this planet. If anything happens to you, you say, my relatives, your relatives, then they will enjoy it. That's what you want. Leaving your children and your wife to suffer or your children and your husband, that will not be our portion. Amen. Please, we will have conflict because we have individual differences. We're adults, we're mature, we have views, we have our ideas. But as Christians, let's learn to talk about it. Let's learn to accommodate one another. Let's learn to resolve issues. Let's change our mentality. There are some things that we've inherited and we brought from some part of the world. It's not going to help. You need to enjoy your marriage now. If you're not enjoying it, you need to sit and say, you know what? What can we do to improve this relationship? Why should we... So I mean... Why should we suffer? How long are we going to live on this planet? At most, most you live 120. I don't know how old we are, but minus your age from 120. How long do you want to go on, you know, fighting, having conflict, struggling, and, and just wasting your time? Your marriage should be enjoyed. There are, you know, you, there are compromises to be made, but also God has given us the wisdom to enjoy the relationship. Brethren, we're going to have conflict. But let's learn to resolve our conflict. Let's learn to look at the positive side of things. Let's learn to, you know, have a right perspective on things. And then we'll be able to enjoy what God has given us. Praise the Lord. Our Lord and our God, we just want to thank you for this short word that we've had. We pray, Holy Spirit, that even after we might have left here, you will speak to us individually and collectively. You will pinpoint those areas where we're lacking and where we're short, 
changing ourselves. All those areas where the enemy had come in to bring about conflict, that is blocking all of the progress of our marriage, Lord, you will reveal to us. And you will release unto us the grace to make amen in the mighty name of Jesus. As many marriages that could be at the verge of breakup, because the husband is just doing his own thing, wife is just doing her own thing, there's no unity. I pray, oh God, for healing in such homes in the name of Jesus. Mighty and everlasting Father, I pray you will give us the understanding that this world is not our own, we're just passing through. But whilst we are here, you want us to make the best use of the old Lord relationship you've given to us. Lord, give us the grace and the ability to do that in Jesus' name. When conflict comes, as they will come, Lord, we pray you will give us the wisdom to be able to deal with it. And as many homes that are being wrecked by third parties, Lord, we pray you will arise, O God, and you will deal with such in the name of Jesus. Lord, when we leave this place, let there be a new spirit, a new mind, O God. A mind, O God, to enjoy the best that we have in our home. Let it come upon us in the name of Jesus. Let this night not be a night that will be wasted in the name of Jesus. Turn things around, O God, for those who are hurting, those who are wounded, those who are, O oh Lord, Father, bitter, Jehovah, Lord, I pray by your spirit, you will, O oh Lord, touch them in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, thank you for this night. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray.